Hi, my name is John Long, and I'm a faculty member in the Biosystems and Ag Engineering Department at Oklahoma State. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about spray equipment and spray systems and all the technology that goes into that and how we look at the basics of those types of systems. Um, we can look at a lot of different types of equipment, broadcast sprayers, what we typically think of when we think of spray systems, but things like UAVs and there are a lot of other applications where we actually see broadcast sprayers being used and a lot of different crops. So let's go ahead and jump into it and look at some of the different things related to spray equipment. Anytime I start off talking about spray equipment or any type of liquid application equipment, I like to kind of start off talking about the application triangle. It's kind of a larger triangle composed of three smaller triangles where two of the smaller triangles support the third. And it's kind of a analogy for the fact that our efficacy and our off-target production have to be in place before we can start looking at productivity. And efficacy means how good of a job we are at killing the target that we're looking at. If we're talking about weed control or an off-target production means getting our droplets exactly where we want them to be and not hitting somewhere we don't want them to be, which is going to cost us both maybe possibly a lawsuit and other legal matters, but just the fact that we're going to be wasting a lot of money and time spraying areas that we don't want to spray. So once we have those two things together, then we can start talking about productivity. And productivity means getting faster, wider, larger equipment, those types of things allows us to cover more acres in a shorter amount of time. If we look at the application industry in general and what's happened over the uh, decades in the original kind of application, we did a lot of dusting of different materials and also some liquid application and if historically it was a very inefficient process you can see some of the pictures there on the right hand side of the slide where we're basically misting the entire area with chemical uh, the cost of chemical and the rates we were looking at were really high and the cost was really low so it wasn't worth putting through the effort to do that over time, things have changed, and uh, we're getting down to smaller and smaller rates of active material, and we're getting more specific when we're applying those. But generally, the things that really have changed things and focused things in the last years have been probably the advent of biotechnology has really pushed forward a lot of use of chemicals and crop protection products. But from the equipment side of things, this big change in equipment, the introduction of electronics in a lot of our ag equipment, and the ability to do things like variable rates and site-specific applications. And this really huge focus on drift, and even more so in recent years with a lot of the dicamba issues that we've had. So that leads us to liquid application. What do we do? How are we applying liquids? And the main idea is we're taking something that's in a bulk format, like a tank full of liquid solution. We're trying to spread it out as evenly as possible over the area that we're trying to target. And so we might be doing that something like we're using in a you know boom type of setting here where we have boom broadcast sprayers, both self-propelled and tractor mounted. We might have aerial sprayers here applying a fungicide. We have air assisted sprayers here we see a lot in, in especially crop production and also in orchards and places like that. And then, very common here in Oklahoma, we have boomless types of nozzles where we've foregone the boom to use a larger droplet, wider band spray, single or cluster set of nozzles, which is a different process than the other style. So there are a bunch of different types of applications. We can kind of throw them into a couple different categories. Broadcast, banded, directed, and subsurface. So broadcast is what we've been talking about when we typically think of where we have a set of nozzles, either cone shape or flat fan shaped. They're spaced out evenly along a boom and they're spraying and trying to cover every inch of the ground there in that swath width. Banded tends to skip gaps intentionally where we're treating only a certain area. We're usually typically banding with things like row crops where we want to put material directly over top of the uh, row or maybe over top of the seed as we're planting. Directed is a little bit different. It's kind of another version of banding, except for with directed, we typically have multiple nozzles kind of aimed at the same area so that we get 
maybe an even coating over especially crop on all sides underneath leaves and tops and everywhere else. So it still has a banding width just like our normal banding but instead of a single nozzle we have multiple nozzles. And then subsurface is the last one where we're applying liquid usually with some type of coulter and putting that liquid down underneath the soil. And a lot of times that's going to be something more like a liquid that sometimes we stream on top of the ground like these streamers here but it could be a uh, soil incorporated or uh, banded uh, some type of insecticide or even a fungicide. So there are a lot of different components when we look at spray equipment in general. Uh, the components compose of typically some type of tank to hold liquid different uh, types of pump straining agitation there to keep things mixed and to move fluid around. Uh, we'll see pressure gauges, we'll see flow control devices and hoses all over the place and more nowadays we'll see a lot of electronics being incorporated including GPS control and monitoring solutions. And then most importantly we see nozzles are one of the things we're going to focus quite a bit on in this discussion. So what are the different types of pumps? The pump's kind of the heart of the system and there's really two major what we call categories or types of pumps. They're made by all kinds of different manufacturers. But the two we're going to look at are what we call in general positive displacement and centrifugal. And they each have their purpose and reason. Positive displacement pumps uh, can be thought of as kind of like this syringe here that we see. So we've all seen these syringes, maybe you grew up on a cattle ranch or have been around that type of thing. Uh, you've probably used one of these. And the way this syringe works is whenever I draw fluid in that syringe and I push that fluid out, I've displaced a volume, just like uh, the pistons in your engines. Same kind of concept. So the idea is we create flow or a flow rate, so gallons per minute or something like that based off of this mechanical movement of this piston. So it, it moves down and back up and we've pumped out 50 milliliters of fluid. We displace that much. And so if we move that faster, we pump that piston back and forth faster, we create a faster uh, rate. And so our flow rate or our flow is based off of that movement. The pressure that we see in a lot of systems, and when we talk about pressure, when we start looking at calculating some of these things, it's based off of the resistance downstream. So as long as I have no resistance, I can keep moving this piston back and forth and the fluid coming out of this thing is going to be just flowing perfectly evenly, especially if you had a really large opening here. We would just be able to move fluid fast as we could move this thing. When we start getting resistance, then we start building pressure. So pressure is not something that we directly Create. It's a function of what's happening downstream. So, for example, if we're using a garden hose uh, and we've got the garden hose turned wide open, it's just sitting there flowing out full force. As soon as we put our thumb over that hose, we can feel that pressure build up because we're creating resistance. And the pressure builds up and we get a longer stream because we've built up pressure to create that. A uh, longer stream due to that pressure drop. So pressure generated flow is based off of how fast we're moving our pump essentially. So if we look at positive displacement pumps they're always going to have some type of volume that we're in there we're displacing going from small to large, large to small. So the simplest type of positive displacement pump we're going to see a whole lot especially in a lot of uh, our smaller types of sprayers is a uh, roller pump. And roller pumps have low to moderate volumes uh, in the range of 5 to 30 gallons per minute is all we're going to be able to do. It's not really good for abrasive materials and that's because these rollers here as we rotate around this housing is eccentric and eccentric just means it's kind of lopsided. And so we have an inlet here that when the roller comes in, it creates a, it forces out against the housing and creates a gap between two adjacent rollers that's a certain size. And then we go from kind of small to large and then back to small. So same thing as drawing in that piston on that syringe. We pull it in 
and we get a large area and then we push it back out and we get a small area. So this thing makes a rotation and basically pulls fluid from the inlet side and pushes it over to the outlet side. And so the reason why it's not good for abrasive is because we've got this rollers running around this housing. If we get abrasive stuff, it's just going to wear this housing out quicker. The nice thing about roller pumps is they are usually really good at handling decent pressures. So pressures up to 300 PSI are typical of a lot of these, the ratings. Typically we're not going to run them that high, but they are capable of those types of systems. Diaphragm pumps are another type of pump that's... Uh, really good for abrasive materials and the way it works again is it uses this rubber rubber diaphragm just like your diaphragm in your chest that helps you breathe. Uh, this cam here rotates around on this particular one or this piston showing you that as it moves around it pushes this diaphragm in and out. And so it changes the volume in this chamber from small when it's at the top to large when it's at the bottom. Then we usually have some type of valving to help us, just like valving in a car, and that valving helps us so that flow only goes one direction. So whenever it goes down, this valve opens up and lets flow flow into the main chamber, and then as we push up, this valve shuts, and this one opens up and lets this flow out. So we're bringing fluid in this side and out this other side. So it's really good for abrasive things because we don't really have anything that's rubbing against each other. Maybe these valves a little bit but a lot of times they're rubber also and it's also very very good for high pressures so a lot of high pressure spray systems up to 500 psi we're talking and higher even are use these diaphragm pumps they're also pretty simple to build and make instead of this rotating shaft cam uh, we can use an electric magnet to push this thing in and out just like your speaker on your car bounces in and out because of an electric magnet and so we see these on the little like 12 volt you know atv style pumps we can buy at the mill or atwood or somewhere like that and they work off the same system they're using a diaphragm pump and since we don't move very far here we're building a lot of pressure but we're not moving a lot of flow and so our flow rates are really kind of low so five to six gallons. So we're able to get 30 out of roller pumps. These are going to be really low. That's why they're ideal for those kind of ATV types of pumps. Another type of uh, positive displacement is a peristalctic pump. Uh, this one's going to be more of a specialty type of pump. Uh, we use this in metering. It doesn't have too high of pressure. Uh, it does a decent job. But it's really good for corrosive things or things we don't want to actually get involved with our uh, systems or directly contacting our mechanisms and things inside the pump. So we basically are kind of squeezing like squeezing a tube. So if you've ever ate a Go-Gurt or something like that, you know, or an Icy in the summertime, you squeeze it and push it out the end. So similar type of concept here. And as fast as we rotate, we can push out more or less so we can get down to really small volumes depending on the size of this tubing. And as long as our tubing can handle the chemical, we don't have to worry about our mechanism. Our little rollers and whatnot here are never going to touch it. So it's really good for that. So we see a lot in the direct injected uh, spray systems where we're injecting the chemical at the very last minute uh, into the stream instead of having it pre-mixed. And so that's where we'll see these types of pumps. So if we look at the typical plumbing diagram for a positive displacement pump, we're going to have our main pump here in the center. In this case, we have a diaphragm pump. We're going to have fluid come in from our main storage tank where we might have our mixture. It's going to go through a strainer, and then it's going to enter out of the strainer and go into our main kind of manifold system. And from our main manifold, it can go either out towards the boom system, or it can go back through a throttling valve. And the throttling valve is just designed to allow us to have some agitation so there'll be some type of agitator in the tank or some type of return that we're basically short circuiting the system just so we can put a little bit of the flow rate back into the tank to help kind of mix things up and keep it moving uh, the rest of the fluid the main part of the fluid is going to head towards the boom and if it's wants to go out the boom we're going to energize our boom and we're going to be able to turn on different sections so a lot of our sprayers are going to have multiple sections of boom that we can turn on and off. At least maybe a, a left, a center, and a right section or something like that. 
So before I move forward here, let's back up for a second. Uh, one of the other things that's unique about this system is we have our line strainer, that, which is kind of a wire strainer mesh that keeps things that may have fell into the tank from entering into our pump. We're trying to protect our pump. A lot of our positive displacements have really close tolerances or really close you know, connections between the different surfaces inside. So we don't want to get big gritty things in there or dirt and debris and things because it'll wear our pump out quicker. So we always put kind of this filter strainer on the side, on the intake side of the pump. The other thing you'll see here is there's this pressure relief valve. Positive displacement pumps, remember, they generate flow and pressure as a result of the resistance downstream. So if we turn off all of these uh, boom sections and we don't allow flow to reach back to the tank, as soon as it hits this manifold and it can't go anywhere, it just starts building up pressure. And that pressure is going to cause a line to break or something to eventually fail. So this pressure relief valve is designed to, once we exceed a certain pressure level, it lets the liquid flow past it and go back to the tank. So that's what we're using there. You're going to see this. Anytime you see a positive displacement, you're always going to see a pressure relief valve. So the other type of pump is a centrifugal pump or a non-positive displacement pump. Um, the way it works is it imparts centrifugal forces to the liquid. So basically it uh, creates a lot of speed and that speed then helps to kind of sling that fluid around and, and create that kinetic energy or that energy of motion. So this diagram here shows a typical setup for a uh, centrifugal pump where we have an impeller that's turning at a really high speed. Our inlet side's in the center of that impeller where it's not really moving that much, but we know as we get out to the outer edge of something that's spinning fast, it's spinning much faster than the inside, right? So if we're swinging a baseball bat, the tip of that bat or a golf club, the, the uh, head of the club is moving much, much faster than the where our grip is at. And so we get a big advantage there because of that. Same thing with this impeller. It's spinning fast and the outer tips here are going really fast and so the liquid gets that energy added to it just like hitting a, a golf ball or a baseball and that fluid gets thrown around inside the housing here and then it exits out through the exit and kind of flies out that way. So it's got this energy here just like hitting a baseball or hitting a whole bunch of water molecules instead. And so we create this flow and remember, pressure is generally based off resistance. So it tends to be very high speed, so 3,000 to 4,500 RPMs. They're super high flow rate pumps, you know, 700 to 130 gallons per minute compared to the 30 we saw with that roller pump. But the pressure is really low. We can't generate a whole lot of pressure because of the way the system is designed. So typically we're down in that 30 to 40 PSI range. We can be a little bit higher than that. And so these are really designed for high volume needs. So we see these a lot on big sprayers that uh, maybe don't necessarily need all the pressure. They're not a specialty sprayer. We can get enough pressure to get up there where we need to go. But we need a lot of flow rate because we have a ton of nozzles and maybe we need to agitate things a lot. So we need to run a lot of capacity back into the tank for agitation. So a good way to think of these is kind of like the... A squirrel cage type fan so this is the same type of fan like you might see on the blower inside of your air conditioning unit in your house and you you don't really care about pressure in your air ducts but you want to have a lot of flow because you want to move cool air through your house um, and so same kind of thing this same idea these both use this kind of centrifugal uh, type of uh, forces so if we look at a typical flow diagram for centrifugal pump Again, we start off with the heart of the system here being the centrifugal pump, and then we have our fluid coming out of our tank into our pump. And one of the things you'll notice here is that our, we don't have that line strainer like we had on our positive displacement pump. In this case, it's on the other side. And the reason for that is these non-displacement, um, non-positive displacement pumps, we have to prime them. In other words, we have to have fluid get to that center point. Uh, it's not going to suck or draw fluid very easily, and so we have to have gravity or something to help us get there. So if we put a strainer there, that's one more pressure drop or one more issue thing that could keep the fluid from getting there in a timely manner. 
So we usually see the strainer on the opposite side. We still want to filter the things out. And centrifugal pumps usually don't have those tight tolerances like positive displacement since they're more like a fan. So if a little bit of grit or abrasive gets in there, it's okay. It'll get thrown through the pump and probably chopped up. Some you know trash pumps and things are centrifugals designed to cut things up when they hit the impellers. So once it leaves the line strainer, then it has kind of like two options to go. We can go up back through a throttling valve to go to the jet agitator, the agitation system, or we can go through another throttling valve and go out through the boom. And these throttling valves basically create a resistance difference. So if the resistance is higher, you know, the saying is the path of least resistance is the way we go. So if this is the least resistance, most of the fluid flow is going to go back through here and go through the agitation. If that's high resistance, then our output throttling valve, then our output throttling valve is where most of the fluid is going to go. And again, we're going to go out here and energize solenoids from this boom and cause our boom sections to turn on. Now, one of the things here you'll notice with centrifugal pump, we don't have a pressure relief. We can, what we call deadhead centrifugal pumps, where we can basically, if we could put our hand over the top of this outlet, the water in here would just sit there and spin, spin, and spin in circle. Um, we create a whole lot of heat sitting there stirring it up, just like a blender, um, you know, spinning in place. But we're not going to have to worry about things exploding or, or whatnot from too much pressure. So what about the nozzle? We've talked about pumps, pumps being the heart of the system, but what about the actual nozzle? The nozzle is something that's going to be kind of a really important thing. It's going to cause a lot of our issues and a lot of our victories in spraying in general. And so these are some nozzles that we might see of different types and sorts, um, and they all have different uses and reasons for them. So the big thing that happens with the nozzle and the thing that's going to be 100%, we get our, everything else in our system working correctly, but if we don't pay attention to what's happening with the nozzle, then we have a higher chance of misapplication compared to other things happening. So here we've got a self-spray rig that they weren't doing a very good job of noticing that uh, they had a couple nozzles out in this intersection. So we end up with skips and issues that we have with uh, that misapplication. And so nozzles are important, and we're going to look at four reasons why they're important. Uh, the number one thing is they control the application amount, or the gallons per acre. Number two, they're going to determine the application uniformity, so how uniform we are applying it. Three, they affect the type of coverage we get when we spray, and that coverage goes hand in hand with the fact that they're going to influence the drift potential. And we'll talk about coverage and drift potential and how those kind of go hand in hand. So before we do that, let's talk about a little bit of the nomenclature here. And nomenclature just is a fancy word for saying kind of some of the definitions and things that we look at for nozzles. So a lot of nozzles are going to have some type of notation on them, way that we can identify them. Um, they're going to usually have their trade name, so T-Jet, a.k.a. the manufacturer that made them. Um, they're going to have their series or the name of the nozzle series. So this is an extended range nozzle, or XR is the series name. So if you go to T-Jet's catalog and go look for their SR, XR series nozzles, you're going to find this particular one. Then they're going to have a set of numbers there, and those numbers are going to represent a couple different things. The first couple numbers are going to represent the fan angle the next set of numbers is going to represent the flow rate or the orifice size or the size of the nozzle. And then the last couple letters on older nozzles, sometimes you'll see this V for visio flow color coding. Uh, newer nozzles typically leave that part off um, just because this was a kind of a system that uh, T-Jet kind of helped to uh, kind of put forth and they started using it, and then others kind of picked up on it, and then eventually it became an international standard. Uh, that Basically, the idea is that the nozzle plastic housing is color-coded to the size. So, for example, this one here is 110-degree fan angle. That's where the 110 comes from. And then it's a 04 or 04 or a number 4 size orifice. And that just means that's the size of the opening there that's metering that nozzle and so in this case the ISO standard for that is this red color 
So no matter what manufacturer now that follows that ISO standard, that international standard, you're going to see a number four is always going to be red. And then the last thing indicates stainless steel. Uh, it could be plastic. It could be um, some type of ceramic. There's a lot of, of inserts that we can have in these nozzles depending on what they're used for. The uh, rated pressure, the standardized rated pressure for most nozzle types is going to be 40 PSI. And uh, the only exception to that is flood nozzles, which are a little bit older tech that you'll still run into and see, but um, they're not quite as common in most arenas. And they use 10 PSI for their, their rated pressure. The main thing here is that the international standard uses 40 PSI, essentially. And the idea here is that in 04, uh, whenever we operate... Um, at 40 PSI behind that 04, once we have enough flow rate to create 40 PSI, that flow rate is equal to the size of the nozzle in tenths of a gallon. So let me say that again. Whenever the pressure we measure on the boom is 40 PSI, then the flow rate coming out of this particular nozzle will be 4 tenths of a gallon or 0.4 gallons per minute. And so we can use that as a way to indicate uh, different sizes and use that standard pressure. So, like I said, it controls the amount that we apply, nozzles do, and the good majority of that is based off the orifice size or the size of the nozzle that we're looking at. Uh, then coupled with that is the pressure and the pressure drop we see across the nozzle. And then... Thirdly, which is a little bit less common, is the solution characteristics. There's going to be some effects by solution characteristics. And what I mean by that is the things like viscosity, uh, density, those types of things that will, do, will affect the flow rate to a certain extent. But the first two are going to cause a much larger effect on flow rate. So how do we calibrate nozzles or how do we look at nozzles or pick nozzles for a certain application? And hopefully maybe you've had an opportunity to already experience this and, and look at this idea. So this might be old hat to you. But the first thing we do foremost is go to our label. Our label is the law, as the saying goes. And so our first step is always to go there to the label and figure out what's going on on the label itself. After we go that, we're going to be able to pull from the label a couple things. We're going to pull the application volume, so how much total volume of fluid needs to be applied per acre, for example. And then we have our product rate. So our product rate is how many ounces of actual physical product that we're going to pour out of the jug per uh, area, so per acre, for example. Then we can pick a travel speed. Sometimes we're going to see maybe restrictions on travel speeds, but most of the time we're not. And then we need to figure out on our actual boom that we're using, what's our nozzle spacing uh, for our broadcast nozzle boom. And then we can do use those things to calculate our flow rate of our nozzle. And that's going to let us pick out the correct one out of a, a catalog. So if we look at some labels, there's a lot of different things we see on labels. Uh, other things we see, for example, here on this Prowl H2O label, we have properly calibrated ground equipment in 10 or more gallons of water per acre or 20 or more gallons of liquid fertilizer per acre. So this tells us the total volume we need to be putting out per acre, so 10 gallons or more. And if we're using liquid fertilizers, then we need to be using 20 or more instead of just water. Um, Whereas things like, for example, Roundup Ultra we just looked at, we can go anywhere from 3 to 40 gallons of water per acre. So that's our total volume. And then things like this 24D, we might see a lot of things in here where we might actually have specifications on droplet size. So this is a section on dr spray drift management. And it says we have to use a coarser, coarser spray based off of ASA standard 572 or 385 micron. Uh, mean diameter for spinning atomizer nozzles. So these types of things here where we see these droplet sizes, we see the um, broadcast gallons per acre, that rate, you know, or maybe a, just a range, um, 
those are the things we have to be in tune with when we start looking at our labels and figuring out what we need. So that kind of comes down to the ability to calculate what the nozzle flow rate needs to be. We need to know the nozzle flow rate to be able to go to the catalog and actually pick out the correct nozzle. And so the nozzle size is based off of the sprayer that we're looking at. And so this equation, which is our rate, application rate in gallons per acre, times our speed in miles per hour, times our nozzle spacing or the width of application of one nozzle, divided by 5940 gives us our flow rate of one single nozzle in gallons per minute. So let's look at an example here. Say I want to put out a rate of five gallons per acre, say that roundup label, five's on target there, and I want to spray at seven miles an hour, and I have a 20 inch spacing between my nozzles on a broadcast sprayer. And that width is the amount of space or the width that one nozzle is responsible for. So if we have a sprayer that has a 20 inch spacing between every single nozzle, one nozzle is responsible for halfway to the nozzle on either side of it. So 10 inches one way, 10 inches the other way, and so that gives you a total width of 20 inches. So we get an answer, a result here of this of 0.12. So now we have our gallons per minute that we need for a single nozzle. And then we're going to take that and go to our catalog and figure out what type of nozzle do we need. And so what we do is we go to this nozzle capacity in one gallon per minute, and we're going to use this 0.12 to be able to figure that out. And so we have 0.12 here, we have a 0.12 between these two, and we have a 0.212 right here. Typically, in a lot of catalogs, the way nozzles are designed, we're usually going to find at least three nozzles that can, can doesn't mean that we should use them, but they can produce a flow rate that we desire, or the one we've calculated. And so we're going to pick our nozzle based off of the one that we think is going to give us the best application. A lot of times that means picking the one that we're going to be in kind of the middle of this range. That way if we need to slow down, we need to speed up a little bit, that's going to be super helpful. So then right across from that, we're going to look at our PSI column. And that tells us basically on our pressure gauge, that we see here, you know, that was going to be on our boom. It'll tell us we can adjust our uh, relief or we can adjust our uh, throttling valves until we get to that pressure. And then when we know we're at that pressure, we know we're at that flow rate when we calibrate. We can also go back over and double check. Uh, a lot of them are going to have a speed category over here that does the math for us that we just did. And so we know that we're shooting for five gallons per acre and so here under the seven miles per hour column for each of those 0.12s we're getting roughly around that five gallons per acre. So let's look at another example here. Say we've got 10 gallons per acre that's our target. We want to spray a little bit faster at 12 miles an hour and we have that same standard kind of 20 inches of nozzle spacing. So that gives us 0.4 gallons per minute which is a pretty typical nozzle type of flow rate. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go find that 0.4. So here I have a, uh, a Turbo T110 type of nozzle here. We have a 03, an 04, and 05 in the blue, red, and brown colors. So again, just like before, we're going to find those spots where we have our 0.4 in this capacity of one nozzle per gallon gallon per minute column. So here we have 0.4, here we have 0.4, and somewhere in here we have 0.4. And so you'll notice the corresponding pressures we have are somewhere uh, between 20 and 30 psi, right at 40 psi, and then somewhere between 60 and 75 psi. And so one of the things you'll notice here is as we increase in nozzle size, so we go from a three to four to five, the pressure requirement goes down. So we go from uh, 60 something PSI to 40 something to 20 something. There's a relationship between pressure and flow rate for 
most nozzles based off of what we call orifice flow. So it's fall, fluids fl kind of flowing out of a, a hole or an orifice. And it follows this relationship that if we want to double our flow, we have to multiply our pressure times 4. Or basically, we are using this squared relationship. So if we look at the overall pressure on our total system, we go from 0.18 to 0.45 in flow rate for one nozzle. And we go from 15 PSI to 90 PSI. So that's about a six times pressure increase. And we only get about a two and a half times flow rate increase. And that kind of makes sense because if we take the square root of six, we get 2.449. So it's this squared relationship where we basically have to square our pressure. So raise it to the power of two to basically double our flow rate. Um, or to triple our flow rate or whatever we're doing to our flow rate. So it's a squared relationship here. So because of that, if we want to increase our flow rate, then again we have to increase our pressure significantly. It's just to double our nozzle flow rate, we have to increase our pressure four times. And that gives us a you know four times application rate technically. Then if we maybe double our travel speed, that cuts our application rate in half because we're putting out the same amount of volume out of the nozzle, but we're covering twice as much area. And so to compensate for a double travel speed, we have to go back and bump our pressure up to give us more flow rate. If we've doubled our travel speed, we got to double our flow rate so that we keep the same application rate um, in gallons per acre, for example. So, for example, if we're going 6 miles an hour at 25 PSI, that's pretty low. If we get to the end of the field, we need to finish out the last bit because the forecast is showing rain coming up or something. We've got to increase our pressure to 100 PSI to be able to double our speed or, or go up there. So we went from 25 PSI to 100 PSI. And so that's typically the issue here is that if we want to change our speed too much in the field either up or down because we need to slow down to go around a turn or we need to uh, you know increase our speed for some reason we don't have a whole lot of range in a typical nozzle and so our normal rate controllers are designed such they adjust our pressure they know that at 60 psi i get this flow rate and at you know 100 psi i get this flow rate and so what it does is it changes some valves in there, opens valves up, and allows basically the pressure to rise and fall based off of what flow rate we need to have out of our nozzles. Well, the issue is that there's going to be limitations to that, and so we need to be able to, to be concerned with that. And so this concept of pulse width modulation, newer sprayers kind of pulse on and off, and those are designed to basically provide that range that we typically don't get with this typical rate controller. So here's a diagram of a normal rate controller. Again, here's a this is centrifugal pump, right? So we've got our pump sprayer. We've got it going through and all the way to the booms. So a couple added things here. We've got a regulating valve. So this is kind of like a throttling valve. It can turn on and off completely all the way shut or all the way open or somewhere in between. And it's electric. So basically the rate controller can power that thing and open and close the valve. So if it shuts it all the way off, we get less pressure in our boom sections and our boom section pressure drops. If it opens it all the way up, we get a lot of pressure in our boom sections as we're trying to push that flow through there. We have a flow sensor here that's giving us feedback and telling us what the total boom flow is. And then again, we can usually turn on all and off our boom valves. And the other input we need for a sprayer is we need some type of speed mechanism. Older ones are going to have a little radar that's going to give us basically our current speed of our, of our sprayer. Newer ones might use that, but might also use GPS because GPS is pretty common nowadays to give us speed. So it's just going to basically be checking and seeing what rate are we at how fast are we going? What should the flow rate be? 
that flow rate's equal to a certain pressure. Okay, I need to open and shut this valve to make that pressure happen. So whenever we're kind of looking at these nozzles and the nozzle systems and we got it all together, one of the most important things we can do is calibrate. Uh, even that electronically controlled system there that has a rate controller that we rely on the computer, it only works as well as our nozzles are calibrated. And so whatever you give it, whatever information it gets, um, it's not going to be as good um, as well, essentially, whatever it's reading, if it's reading something that's wrong, it's going to give you a wrong value, um, and you're going to think it's right. So it's important to always double-check things like that and do catch-can types of uh, calibrations, which I'm sure that you've been familiar with, or if you haven't, uh, it's a very simple process. So first one's flow rate. That's the important part of a nozzle is to be able to get the right rate out there. And then the rest of those, the things that we talked about uh, initially with nozzles are going to be, you know, little minor things that can actually add up to be a whole lot, but they're not going to affect our rate. They're going to affect more how we put it out, not necessarily the amount we put out, but how it's being uh, applied. Um, and the second one is uniformity. So it's important for a system to apply the chemical uniformly. And usually with a broadcast, we're talking about from one end of the boom to the other end of the boom, we want to have the exact same amount coming out all across the whole boom at the same time. And since we typically use flat fan nozzles, like you can see here in the picture, they kind of look like a triangle as they angle out. So we talked about 110 degree, they might be 80 degree, whatever they are. Um, typically for our nozzles, we have a certain spacing and that spacing we want to have some overlap because these nozzles don't put out the same amount of material from say the left edge to the right edge. There's usually more in the middle and less on the edges. So we tend to like to overlap adjacent fans so that the area here that's overlapped gets a little bit from one nozzle and a little bit from another nozzle. And that helps to get good coverage that we need for this type of system. And so typically the idea is that we want to stay about 17 to 19 inches above the target to get that 50% overlap minimum. 100% overlap would mean this uh, outer edge here would reach the center edge of the uh, adjacent uh, pattern there. So third is coverage. Um, coverage is basically the idea of looking at how much of the area that we're trying to target are we actually putting droplets on. Um, and coverage is super important in some cases and not as important in other cases. A lot of it has to do with the product that we're using. And that means, you know, knowing what type of pesticide we're using, whether we're talking about a herbicide, a fungicide, insecticide, uh, that kind of thing. And most importantly, the type of kind of mode of action that it handles. How does it work? Is it a systemic type of chemical that is absorbed through the roots, absorbed through the leaves, absorbed through uh, other plant material, um, and then translocated or you know moved through the plant and actually does its work that way? Is it a contact where we're actually seeing damage occurring within proximity of the droplet hitting the leaf, for example. Um, those types of things matter. Um, I've got a picture of some water sensitive cards being placed inside of uh, the canopy here and looking at different leaves down in the canopy and how much of the uh, target is being hit here by these uh, cards. So whenever a water hits it or chemical hits it, it goes from yellow to blue. So on the left hand side we're getting really good coverage. On the right hand side not as much. Bigger droplets. The great thing about this is big droplets, as we'll talk about here in a second, are really good at preventing drift, but they do a poor job of coverage. And so a systemic, where we get enough chemical contacting some part of the plant, it translocates through to every part of the plant. Whereas a contact, we need really good coverage to make it happen, so we might want something more like this left-hand card. So it's really important that we know what our target is. You know, are we trying to hit 
a, uh, a grass or a, a, a monocot type of leaf versus a broad leaf type of leaf? Um, is the surface of leaf, you know, smooth, hairy, waxy? What, what are the things that we have to deal with to get that chemical into that plant? And are we going to get runoff or roll off of the plant from our droplets as soon as they hit it? Um, you know, how's it oriented? Different times of day, sometimes plants will uh, open and close their leaves and that kind of thing. So it's just very important that we know what we're trying to do and how to handle it. It's going to be based off of that and how we set up our equipment. And so there are some kind of selection guides based off of those things. Um, so if we're looking at a post-emergence contact type of herbicide, um, every manufacturer is going to give you some idea of types of nozzles here. This is directly from T-Jet, but every other manufacturer is going to have similar types of sheets like this. And so they're going to suggest different technologies, nozzle technologies, for uh, these types of applications. For example, uh, the Turbo T-Jet induction style nozzle, which is one that is a labeled nozzle for some of the new dicamber products creates really large droplets so we have very little drift it's very excellent for systemic post-emerge excellent for soil plot excellent for systemic fungicide excellent for systemic insecticides excellent for drift management but you can see there's gray boxes and all the contact stuff and that's because it's not a very good choice at all it's not even very good you notice that the manufacturers tend to, you know, they don't want to put bad anywhere. Everything's very good, good, or excellent. So, uh, you know, take that a little bit with a grain of salt when you look at a manufacturer's catalog, knowing that they're going to want to sell you a, a nozzle. So they're not going to, uh, you know, tell you that it's bad, but they're also going to maybe suggest a different one for your application. So that comes down to these ideas of droplet categories and those color codes we saw previously for nozzle sizes uh, we have these different colors like red and yellow and orange and and blue and whatnot do not get those confused with droplet categories so droplet categories is again an ASAB standard 572 that basically categorizes sizes or diameters of droplets into these different general names like extremely fine or medium or extremely coarse um, and those types of things you're going to see on labels they're going to say use a coarse or coarser droplet so that would mean a coarse droplet or very coarse extremely coarse ultra coarse that kind of thing um, and then you have your VMD here um, which is your size in microns and it's the the middle of your um, droplet spectra and so if we look at a particular type of um, technology here as far as nozzle technology, the one on the left is a little bit of an older turbo T-Jet um, type of technology. So it's going to be a pre-chamber style. It's got a, a lot of range here where smaller nozzles here, O1s, one and a s twos, two and a half threes. As we get into the bigger ones, we can start seeing extra coarse, uh, very coarse, coarse, medium, fine. So our smaller nozzles tend to be smaller droplets. Whereas this air induction, one of the original air induction style nozzles, even a one and a half or two, very coarse, which we have to go all the way down to at 30 PSI, we would have to go all the way down to a number five or six in this type of nozzle to get that same droplet spectra. So air induction nozzle here is an example of newer technology designed to create these uh, coarser droplets. So I said that drift is something that's a, an issue and something that's been a focus on the industry for a number of years. And essentially all drift is, is basically movement of spray particles off target. We talk about off target protection, protecting off target areas. Um, and so there's a couple different types of drift that we can look into. There's physical drift and there is uh, chemical drift from volatilization. Um, and physical drift means we essentially are doing a poor job of spraying or applying the chemical and it never ever hit the target. Um, 
whereas other types of drift um, are going to be due to the volatilization where the chemical hits the target correctly, we apply correctly, but due to conditions we get evaporation and that material then leaves the plant surface or whatever it is and heads elsewhere. Um, so those are ones we can't control really as much from an equipment standpoint. So we know that small droplets tend to create this drift cloud that we see here in these pictures. And we talked about earlier how small droplets is what we need for good coverage. Whereas these bigger droplet nozzles are designed to reduce drift, but we also compensate or kind of give in the fact that we cannot have coverage. So there's kind of this invisible dividing line between coverage and drift and it's kind of a balancing game of how do we determine what we need well we need as big of droplet as we possibly can get by with and still maintain the coverage that we want and that's because if we look at any kind of droplet here if I uh, turn on a sprayer and spray it on a piece of glass like this picture here I'm going to get big droplets, or I'm going to get small droplets, I'm going to get tiny, tiny droplets here. And we're going to create a multitude of droplets out of a nozzle. Just because it says it's a coarse nozzle does not mean it's going to produce all coarse droplets. It's going to create the middle or the median droplet size is going to be coarse. That means we're still going to have half the volume that's going to be smaller, half the volume is going to be larger than that. So sometimes we want to be able to, to uh, adjust droplet size and droplet size has a lot to do with the amount of volume that we have available. If we're putting out 10 gallons per acre, we only have 10 gallons to spread out over that acre. So if we want to make big droplets, we're only going to have enough volume to make a certain number of those. If we make small droplets, then we use less volume in every single droplet and so we can produce more droplets. So to give us an idea of that, the kind of relationship between a big droplet and a droplet half of its size is if we take a big droplet like this uh, extremely coarse 500 micron droplet and we cut that sucker in half and make it a 250 micron, so we're going to cut the diameter in half, the volume inside of one 500 micron droplet can turn into basically eight 250 micron droplets. So anytime we cut the diameter in half, that volume can then make eight times the number of droplets in a diameter half that size. And so that's great that we can create all these droplets and get more coverage. Where we run into issues is when we think about going the other direction. So here I've got a, a, uh, a fine type of of droplet coverage good really good coverage on my slide here uh, you know I've got all these 125 micron droplets spread out evenly let's say I instead of spraying like I've been normally spraying with this 125 and these have a lot of driftable fines that are going to drift everywhere if the winds right I want to go to a bigger nozzle and you know reduce the number of amount of drifting I've got I'm still putting out 10 gallons per acre let's say but I'm gonna go up to you know 250 micron droplets well if I take the volume that was going to hit this leaf in these small fines and I cut it down to 250 microns I went from a whole page worth of small droplets to only essentially eight uh, 250 micron droplets and then say I need to go coarser yet the volume in those eight are going to turn into a single 500 micron droplet so our coverage has gone from excellent to pitiful um, and that's just because of this idea that we're limited in volume so the only way we can basically use big droplets and still get good coverage is to change our spray volume and so here going from a 10 gallon breaker to a 15 gallon breaker same kind of speed and and droplet spectra but here we get a lot more coverage because we've got more droplets to distribute. That's really what it comes down to. And so there's a couple of relationships based off the of droplet size. Not only the technology uh, helps us produce 
uh, different sizes of droplets and produce maybe a coarser droplet versus an extra coarse, whatever it may be, within a nozzle series or uh, type of technology, larger nozzles can produce big droplets and smaller nozzles can produce smaller droplets. And so, like I said, there are a lot of technologies out there that have been focused on in industry to help try to improve the spray quality or the drift um, causing uh, nature of older nozzles. And so the idea here is that of that distribution of nozzle of droplets we saw, we produce less of those smaller ones on a volumetric basis. And so it helps with that. And so we've got a lot of different types that we can look at. Really the major ones that we're going to see out there are going to be the flat fan, which are the older type of nozzles that have really very little um, ability to reduce the number of drifted fines. And so when they get up to higher pressures, they tend to produce a lot of drift hole fines. Then the next technology that kind of came out maybe 10 years down the road from that or more is the, the chamber style with the pre-orifice. So essentially we separate the metering mechanism from the droplet uh, forming mechanism. So the fan shaping or the, the shaping of the the spray pattern um, is separate from the actual meter. And our metering occurs here in this pre-orifice where we basically neck down the fluid to a certain diameter that meters the fluid because pressure builds up behind this. And then when it falls into this chamber, then it only has to worry about being forced out of a large opening and creating a fan. So we end up creating big droplets instead of having our pressure drop occurring right here like we do in the flat fan. And the flat fan, our metering and our fan forming are all in the same piece. They're exactly right there at the same spot. Then the final type that has been a more recent thing that has really uh, pushed large droplets is air induction. Air induction always has some kind of air port um, where we can pull in uh, air. And it's got a little venturi that basically as fluid comes in the main part, air gets drawn in at the exact same time and the air mixes with the water and it forces itself out through that again the fan forming section so we do have a pre orifice just like we have in the chamber the difference here is in this chamber before we get to our kind of fan forming piece we have a chamber area that's using that force of that pre chamber jet that's coming in to pull air in so pull air in through here, mix it, and then basically we get an air mixture of droplets that are droplets that have air and water in them. So the size is larger, but the volume of actual liquid in there is smaller for that droplet size. And so here's some examples of these two concepts where we have this pre-orifice here, the setup that meters it, and then we have a chamber, and here we have a flood style nozzle that has a big chamber in line with the pre-orifice, and the uh, T-Jets Turbo Tees, which is a very popular pre-chamber style. Again, they've turned the chamber sideways just to make the nozzle a little shorter, essentially, so we're not catching it on things. And then the uh, original kind of air induction, again, We've got this pre-orifice that meters it, and then we have a section here where we are uh, pushing fluid down through, and the air comes in this same mechanism here at the same time when when the uh, liquid's moving through this kind of crossed area, air gets drawn in on either side and mixes in, in this mixing chamber, and then it comes out through the fan uh, tip there nozzle. And so does that make a difference? Uh, it makes a lot of difference. This is a kind of a wind tunnel test where we took uh, different types of nozzles here. So this ends more of the flat fans, those original flat fans, and we get into some of the turbo tees and things like that. And then here we have the air induction AIs um, and air induction and ultra low drifts, uh, which is a, another air induction nozzle. Um, they're down here and they are producing a lot less coverage. So basically one meter downwind 
in the wind tunnel from the nozzle itself. We put a bunch of cards like we sh I showed you earlier and we looked at how much of the card was covered by droplets and uh, those old um, 80 degree and 110 degree uh, flat fan nozzles were covering those cards fairly well, soaking them good. And as we got down to our newer technologies, we're getting less and less um, that's getting downstream, blown downstream. So what are the things here that we need to be concerned about? How can we reduce drift and, and all? One, it comes down with nozzle selection, picking a nozzle technology like we just looked at that's going to give us a coarse type of droplet. Uh, lowering our pressure, we know that as the pressure decreases on those charts, we get larger droplets, and so that's going to help us with drift. Um, lowering our boom, keeping our boom down and closer to the target. Uh, a droplet has to leave the nozzle and move from the length from the nozzle to wherever the target is, the top of the canopy or whatever it is. The closer our boom is to that target, the less travel we have to go through to get to the target and less chance of wind pushing it sideways. Picking larger nozzles are always going to be helpful. We talked about how larger nozzles, again, produces larger droplets. That's kind of the, the uh, theme here, larger droplets. Keeping our winds down, so even uh, with the fact of producing all these things, we are going to get some movement and we want to minimize that so we don't want to be you know spraying to hurricane or or uh, huge winds knowing our wind direction so that when we do have winds and there's no way to avoid it especially here in Oklahoma but just knowing which direction they're heading so that we're you know at the worst case going to be uh, maybe over spraying a little bit onto our same field rather than over spraying into the neighbor's rose garden or something and then seven is temperature inversions. Uh, this is something that's been kind of uh, more common lately as far as people talking about it, but it's these very calm conditions where we don't get good mixing with the upper atmosphere. It's those days when we get fog hanging or smoke just hangs and doesn't want to go anywhere. Uh, and those are the, the days where we think it would be nice to spray because the wind's low, but... Uh, it's going to cause any kind of volatilization to be trapped and not uh, be able to leave and dilute in the upper atmosphere. And then the last piece I look at here is drift additives. There's a ton of things out there uh, being sold by a lot of different companies. Many of them are very good products, uh, but they're not a miracle in a bottle. We're not going to be able to dump them in the tank and say, oh, we can go spraying 25 mile an hour winds uh, with a boom, you know, six foot off the ground. Those things aren't going to happen. They're not going to fix that. So you got to fix the first kind of six and be aware of the first six to seven things here before we can start dumping things in the tank. So with that, I'll uh, be happy to answer any questions. This is my contact information. You're welcome to contact me, email me, or whatnot. Call me, and I'll be around. My office is in 124 Ag Hall in the South Wing. Uh, any point in time you want to stop by and ask a question, you're welcome to do so. Um, also, if you want to meet virtually, uh, you can give me a call or email me and we can set that up too. So with that, I will uh, leave you to this and uh, good luck with the rest of your studies this semester.